Grande crack gasoline or nothing else. See, hey, that Rio Grande crack is the gasoline they're using in police cars, ain't it? Sure. I should think it would be too good for an old truck like this. Listen, no gasoline's too good for any kind of engine. I use Rio Grande crack in the old Ford, the Model C, and you think it'd run on kerosene. Well, it will. But by gosh, when I see the crack gasoline, it runs like a new streamlined Chrysler. Say, look at that guy coming toward us. I guess he's using that crack gasoline all right. Must be doing 80. Hey, Joe, what's the matter with you? You nearly ran over that guy. I couldn't help it. I dimmed him the lights and he left his full on. There ought to be a law against these automobiles cluttering up the road. What's the matter? Are you getting sleepy? Yeah, sort of. Yeah, this is a tough run. First out of loss in one jump. Yeah, especially when you're stirring enough gasoline to float a feather ship. Come on, I'll take on for a while. Oh, no, you're all in, too. Well, I don't want to go skidding over the side somewhere up on the grade. Ah, oh, don't worry. I'm going to pull up beside the road for a while. We can both get a nap. Yeah, that's a good idea. Sure, what's the difference if we're half an hour late getting in? Well, tell them we had tire trucks. Okay. Well, this looks like a good place here. Say, hey, Joe. Look. There's a guy laying in the ditch. Where? Right up the road there. Oh, yeah. Hey, do you suppose this is a hold-up decoy? Maybe. Let's get out of here there. Yeah, wait a minute, wait a minute. We got a gun with us, Henry? Yeah. Well, come on, break it out. And if it's a hold-up gag, well, we'll let him have it quick enough. Yeah, but... but... Now, listen, now. Maybe this guy's hurt. Maybe he needs help. Okay, then. Here. Here's the gun. You carry it. All right, let's get a look at it. Hey. Hey, you need any help? He doesn't answer, Joe. I just suppose I know that. Hey, buddy, what's the matter? Hey, Joe. Joe, he's hurt. Look, hurt? I'll say he's hurt. He's dead. He's been shot twice through the head. Yeah, and he's been jumped out of a car. Hey, I wonder if that car that ran past almost ran into us. Oh, but... come on, come on. We're scram right now. This don't look very good to me. Let's go. Hey, we're scramming all right to the first police station. <laughs> Sheriff's Office, homicide detail. Hello, Ventura calling. Hold the line, please. You may go ahead. Hello? Hello. Hello, Sheriff's Office? Yeah? Deputy Wallace from Ventura County. Yeah? Found a body on the highway near Camarillo this morning. Yeah? Shot twice to the head. Yeah? Well, what do you want us to do about it? Well, we think he was bumped off in your county and dumped out up here. Yeah? What makes you think so? Well, it looks that way. We need some help on this case. Okay, I'll send somebody up right away. Hmm, looks like an Italian. They sure got him right, didn't they? I'll say they didn't. About 30 years old, huh? Yeah, that'd be my guess. Six feet about. Brown eyes. Three is Scar on the Ford. A day. Yes, sir. So shall we close? Yeah. What'd you find? Some money? Much? Yeah, about 20 bucks. No robbery, then. What else? A gold watch? That proves it. A pack of matches from the buffet in Venice and some foam old cigarettes and this. What's that? Search me. Piece of paper says Mildred and then there's some numbers. Hmm. Might be a telephone number. Yeah, but there are no exchange letters. Yeah, but maybe those first two numbers, four or five, stand for the exchange letters on the dial. Oh. Sure, look. The numbers are four, five, one, five, five, one. That might mean, let me see, one, A, B, C, D. Sure, that might be glad to show in 1551. Five, yeah, it might. Get to the office of phone and tell them to trace down those numbers right away. Yes, sir. Cooperating with the sheriff's office, the telephone company quickly reports that the number Gladstone 1551 is registered to a Mr. Thomas Myers. He and his wife are requested to come to headquarters to be questioned by Captain Bright of the Sheriff's Homicide Detail. Ms. Myers, there's been a murder committed. A murder? Yes. A man was found shot to death near Camarillo this morning. Well, and just what has this got to do with my wife and myself? That, Mr. Myers, is what I've asked you to come down here for. Find out just what it has to do with you. All right. What do you mean? Your wife's name and telephone number were found in the murdered man's pocket. What? Yes, Mrs. Myers, your name and telephone number were found in his pocket. Oh, but, but this is ridiculous. I'm sorry, but it's true. Fingerprints of the victim haven't helped to identify him. Perhaps you or Mr. Myers can. But I don't know anybody like that. Anybody that goes around getting shot. Oh, well, he was about six feet tall, well-dressed, scar on the forehead. 
smoked Pall Mall cigarettes, and he carried your phone number in his pocket. But, but this... And here's the picture of the body. You know him? Mm-hmm. Do you, Mr. Myers? No, I never saw him before in my life. And furthermore... Wait a minute, Mr. Myers. No shadow of suspicion is directed against you or Mrs. Myers. We're trying to get an identification. Yes, but you've heard my wife and I both tell you we never saw the man. Then how does it happen your phone number was in his pocket? How, how should I know? And your wife's name. Do you mean to infer I that I want an identification of this body? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh. Okay. Maybe. Maybe Christine. Christine, who's she? My, my. Go ahead, Mildred. Tell him. She's my sister. Yes? Well, she... She's been having trouble with her husband, and she's been living in Venice with a girlfriend. Yes? Well, I, I've been worrying about her, so last night, I... Yes, what happened last night? Well, Mr. Myers and I drove to Venice to get her, to bring her back to town to stay with us. Tom stayed in the car, and I went up to the apartment. There were three men there. They, they looked like Italians. Italians? Yes. What happened? Well, I, I wanted to talk to Christine. There wasn't any place to go, but finally we went into the bedroom. I argued with her for quite some time. Christine, darling, we're worried about you, Tom and I. You don't have to worry about me. No, but you do. Christine, honey, when Mama passed on, she, almost the last thing she said was for me to look after you. I'm all right, Mildred. Well, maybe you are, but... I don't like all this. Oh, what? What's the matter with this place? Oh, it's all right, honey. Look, honey, wouldn't you like to come back with us for a few days? Oh, do let me take care of you. Please, you look tired. It'll do you good, Christine. Oh, Mildred, I'm not a baby. Well, I know you aren't. But somehow to me, Christine, you are a little bit. You always were Mama's baby, you know. Yes, I know. Always somebody's baby. What do you mean? Oh, nothing. Okay, Mildred, I'll go with you. Oh, that's, that's fine, Christine. I'm awfully glad. Only, Mildred, will you come back for me in, in about a half an hour? Well, why? After all, Stella and the boys have been pretty nice to me. And I want to say goodbye in my own way. All right, honey. I'll be waiting outside in half an hour. Okay, I'll be there. We drove around for about half an hour, and then we came back and we parked outside. And just before Christine came out, those three fellows left the place and got into a great packet roadster and drove away. Great packet roadster, got that? Yes, sir. Go ahead, Miss Myers. Well, on the way back to town, Christine seemed a bit like herself. She didn't talk at all. She was sort of blue. And when we got to the house, she suddenly demanded that Tom take her back to Venice. Did he? Did I? Yes, I did. Didn't get back until two in the morning. What was the big idea? I don't know. Only she said again that they'd all been so nice to her down there that she couldn't walk out on them. Only... Only what? Only this morning she came back to town and went straight up to my aunt. Oh, I can't make head and tail out of the whole thing. What's your sister's full name? Christine McSwiggin. And what's the name of this estranged husband of hers? Well, I... I don't know if Oh, I go know. ahead. Tell them, Mildred. Well, she, she's married to Ted McSwiggin. Ted McSwiggin? Oh, the big shot Hollywood bootlegger, huh? Yes. And she's been playing around with some smooth Italian boys, huh? Well, that makes the picture a little different. Sergeant? Yes, sir. Tell the boys to bring in Ted McSwiggin. I've got a few questions that I think he's got the answers to. <laughs> While one detail of men search for Ted McSwiggin, another combs the town for his estranged wife, Christine. She is the first to be apprehended and brought into Captain Bright's office. Mrs. McSwiggin, there was a murder committed last night. What do you know about it? Only what my sister told me she'd learned from you. What's the name of the girl you've been living with? Stella. Stella Pacetta. And who are those three Italians who visited you last night? Oh, just... Some friends of Stella's and mine. I insist on knowing their names. Well, one was named Frankie. One they called Tommy, and the other was Vince. I don't know their last names. What happened last night when they came to see you? Oh, nothing. They just dropped in. What did you have to drink? Nothing. The boys don't drink. Only a little wine sometimes, and they didn't have any of that with them. 
Now, tell me in your own words what happened last night. Well, they just dropped in to say hello, and my sister came in, too, and wanted me to go back to L.A. with her. And I told her I'd meet her in half an hour, and after that, she left me. Well, Chris, maybe I don't see you for a long time. Oh, Frankie, why not? Where are you going? I'm going to Frisco, maybe. What's the big idea? I've got a deal up with you. Maybe I want you to come up there. You like her to do that? Maybe. Okay. I'll call you long distance when she's set up. Will you? On the level? Sure. Frankie Moretta, he never go back on his word. <laughs> and I'll call you here the first chance I get. Oh, no, not here. Why not? I'm going up to town for a while with my sister. Oh, okay. What's your number? Her number's Gladstone 1551. Now, wait till I write it down. Now, first, tell me, what's her name? Her name is Mildred. Oh, Mildred, huh? All right, what's her number? Gladstone. Gladstone. How do you spell it out? Oh, just put it down in numbers like you dial it. Oh, sure. That's better. Now, what's the number? 451551. Oh, she's a pipe. Now, you call me. Don't forget. Forget? How could I forget the bambina Oh, so you gave him your sister's phone number, eh? Yes. Mrs. McSwigan, I have a picture here. I'd like you to see it. You recognize this body? <gasps> oh, oh, it's Frankie. It's Frankie. Yeah, I thought so. What's left of him? Tough seeing your sweetie look like that, huh? He isn't. He, isn't. he wasn't my sweetie. He was just a, just a friend of mine. Oh, yeah? Well, who killed him? I, how, how should I know? You ought to know, Mrs. McSwigan. You ought to have a pretty good idea, for instance, whether Mr. McSwiggin killed him or not. Ted! Well, you're, you're crazy. Ted wouldn't. Yeah? Well, maybe he wouldn't. But we're going to make sure of that by placing him under arrest on suspicion of murder. From all I gather, he had the best motive of any suspect I've seen so far. Later in the day, officers Brewster and Corsini of the Los Angeles Police Department report the results of their investigation in Venice to Captain Bright. Well, Captain, here's the dope. On February 19th, two Italians who gave their names to Thomas Pasquale and Vincent Barnes, Barco, rather, rented apartment 43 at the St. Regent Apartments in Venice. Yeah? Two days later, a girl who registered as Stella Pesetta took apartment 405 next door to the boys. Yeah? And a few days after that, a blonde girl moved in with her. And that would be this McSwiggin day. But here's the payoff. Four o'clock yesterday morning, the landlady saw lights in both apartments. Yeah. And at eight o'clock, the tenants of both apartments had moved out. Yeah, took it on the land, huh? Looks that way. What did you find in the place? Well, some clothes, some laundry marks, the same as we found on the stiff, and some Paul Mall cigarettes. Beg pardon, Captain. What is it, Sergeant? Got a report from the cab driver that brought those dames in from Venice this morning. Yeah, what is it? Well, the blonde left the cab near 64th and Merrill Street, and the brunette got out of the Great Western Hotel on 6th Street. That's swell. Cassini? Yes, sir. Go down there to the Great Western and bring back this Stella Pacetta. Corsini and Brewster discover that although no one is registered at the Great Western by the name of Pacetta, a woman answering the description given by the cab driver came into the hotel that morning and gave her name as Mrs. Tron Colley. The two detectives lose no time in getting to her room. What? You are Miss Pasella? Oh, um, well, no, you made a mistake. I'm Mrs. Tron Colley. I, I was expecting somebody else. Mrs. Tron Colley, eh? Alias Miss Pasella, or is it the other way around? You made a mistake. Now go away and stop bothering me. We're police officers. Will you come with us quietly? I certainly will not. You're mistaken. I'm Mrs. Tron Colley. Well, in that case, we'll only detain you for a few minutes. Just long enough for you to prove to us that you are Mrs. Tron Colley. Oh, all right, I'll go with you. That's more like it. Well, can I phone a friend of mine first? No, I'm afraid we can't let you do that. Well, can I leave a note in the lobby? Note? Why, yes, I guess there's no objection to that, is there, Captain? Well, None that I can think of. Excuse me just a minute while I write it. Sure, go ahead. All right, there. Now, are you gentlemen ready? Ready and waiting. Let's go. 
Now, perhaps you can tell me what is the occasion for this charming visit. Mm, the captain wants to ask you a few questions. A few questions about what? Better let him tell you. Our orders are to bring you in. Well, I don't see why I haven't parked near any fire plugs or disturbed the peace or broken the speed limit. Why do the police want to talk to me? Well, just hold your horses and you'll find out. Well, it's all a mystery to me. Oh, just a minute. I want to leave this note. Yeah, go right ahead. Yes, Mr. Crown Kelly. What can I do for you? Hey, uh, give this note to my my friend when he comes in. Oh, certainly. Thanks. All right, gentlemen. I'm your guest for the rest of the evening. Charming. Let's go out this way. Oh, Corsini. Yes? Are you going out to the car? I just thought I've, uh, I've got to call him to the station. Okay, hurry up. Hey, you. I guess there's something you wish? Yeah, give me the note that dame just left. Oh, I can't do that, you know. You're not the gentleman for whom it was intended. Yeah? You see this buzzer? Oh, detective. Yeah, well, now hand it over. Yes, 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 here. Hmm. Honey, they are taking me to jail. Stay away until you hear from me. <laughs> I'll take care of this, buddy, and don't deliver any messages to anyone. We'll be back. Brewster and Corsini take Stella into Captain Bright's office and then return to the Great Western Hotel to stake out for the person to whom her note had been addressed. Captain Bright questions Stella. You're a seller for Sarah? Yes. And you've been living in Venice with Christine McSwiggan, huh? Uh, I don't know Christine McSwiggan, and I never lived in Venice. Well, that's strange. Christine claims you're a very good friend of hers. I refuse to make any statements till I've seen an attorney. Oh, you don't care to help us find out who killed your friend Frankie, huh? I don't know anything about anybody being killed. Perhaps you'd recognize this picture. God, it's Frankie, all right. Pally, all right, huh? What's his full name? Frankie Moretti. Where's his friend Vincent Barco? Well, how should I know? Weren't you his girlfriend? Not exactly. Who was the third boy? His name was Tony Cifali. Who killed Frankie? Well, how do I know? Did Tedward Swiggin do it? He might have. Or did Tom and Vince take their pal Frankie for a one-way ride? They wouldn't do that. They were good friends. Oh, well, then how do you account for them coming back to the apartment in the middle of the night without Frankie, packing up their things and leaving? Why did you girls follow right after him? Well, I'm not going to talk till I've seen an attorney. Why? Because you have a guilty knowledge of the murder? You can't make me talk, and I won't. Pardon me, Captain. We got Vince Barco out here. Good. Shall I bring him in? Now, wait a minute. I'm going to detain you, Mr. Sutter. You know more about this thing than you're willing to tell. Take this woman out to the booking clerk, Cassini. Okay. Bring in Barco, Brewster. Yes, sir. All right, you come on in. Well, here he is, Captain. We picked him up when we called for that note at the Great Western. Says he rooms with his pal Tom Pasquale at the Argonaut, so we sent Cruzhorn and Romero to bring him in. Hey, what's the big idea to make it the big You're thing? not here to ask questions. You're here to answer them. Now, what do you know about that murder last night? I don't know nothing. Recognize this picture? No. You know Stella Pacetta? No. You know Christine McSwiggan? No. Uh, we found this on him, Captain. Hmm. Hmm, very interesting. How about this, Barco? How come you have in your possession a receipted bill made out to Frank Moretti for an apartment in Venice? Oh, I, I find that in my apartment. This guy is to come in and ask me to lend him a 20 bucks. I don't know him so good, so I figure, oh, what's the 20 bucks to win the Barco? So I, I let him have it. What are you lying for, Barco? Why don't you admit you killed him? Me, I don't kill nobody. Beg pardon, Captain. Bruchon just came in with the other fellow, Pasquale. Ah, that's fine. Tell him to wait outside until I'm through this one. Yes, sir. Sergeant. Yes. What's the report on McSwiggan? Uh, nothing, sir. No one seems to be able to locate him. He's just dropped right out of sight. Well, you tell those guys to keep after him and don't come back without him. any information. But his partner, when questioned, admits having known Moretti, but denies any knowledge of the murder. From him, Bright learns that Moretti was a native of New York. He sends New York police photographs of the body and fingerprints of the dead man and asks for further identification. If you 
hours later, a blood-stained murder car is found abandoned in a garage on Echo Park Avenue. Attendants identify Pat Pauly and Barco as the men who left it there. The search for McSwigan continues. But at noon the next day, he has not been apprehended. Captain Bright is furious. Fort Beatty, Brewster. Yes, sir. What about this guy, McQuiggan? Well, the boys say they can't find him anyplace. I don't know. Look here, I want that man brought in here if I have to spend every policeman in Los Angeles. Do you understand? Yes, sir, but I don't see why... Don't give me any excuses. Go get him. Beg pardon, sir. Here's the leak sheet for today. Thanks, Sergeant. And Cassini, don't come back without him. Yes, sir. Well, I'll be a... Cassini. Cassini. Yes, sir. Come here. What is it, Captain? Uh, I think I can give you a line on where you can find McSwiggin. You can, sir. Uh, according to this makesheet, he was picked up night before last for suspicion of robbery. You mean he's been in the can all through this thing? Ah, uh, looks like it. So you can find him at Lincoln Heights Jail. Bring him over here anyway. I might as well talk to him. All right, then. <laughs> The annoyed and surprised McSwigan is brought before Captain Bright and informed of the situation. So you thought I bumped off the guy, huh? Well, I got the best alibi in the world. I was in the can. Yeah, well, what time was your wreck? About 8 p.m. Taking a couple of suits of clothes from my house to my car. Some smart old biddy up the street calls the cops, and they pinch me for robbery. Imagine getting pinched for carrying your own clothes from your own house to your own car. I was burned up plenty. I guess it was the best break a guy could have had. You can't pin this one on me. Now, you got any idea who did this job? How should I know? My wife, Christine, has been running around with some wops. Maybe they did it. I told her to keep away from those birds. Why? Don't you think I know a racket man when I see one? Was the guy on this picture one of the Italians you refer to? Boy, they sure got him, didn't they? What a neat bump off. Was this one of the guys? Yeah, that's one of them. I him with Chris a couple of times. You know, Captain, that dame's nuts running around with a bunch of mugs like that. Yeah. Well, you had a very good motive for wanting this man out of the way, McSwiggin. Yeah, that's what you think. But my wheels don't go around that way. I knew she'd get tired of him sooner or later and come back to me. And if she didn't, well, what of it? The best dame in the world walked out on me. I'll just mix another drink. Thanks, pardon, Captain. What is it? Wire from New York, sir, and reply to your query about Moretti. What's it say? Moretti is a gunman with a record in New York. His brother was bumped off a few months ago by Tony Barco, brother of the Vince Barco we've got in custody. The families have been running out to the mobs for years. Oh, so it's a vendetta, huh? Looks that way. That's the way these Italians work. If you ask me... Barco bumped off Moretti to avenge the death of his brother. Yeah, and if we don't send Barco up for murder, we'll have another homicide in our hands as soon as another Moretti can get out here from New York. Yeah, that's right, Captain. But before you go into that, would you mind returning my suit of clothes and my wife and let me get the hell out of this joint? <laughs> March 26, 1929, Pasquale and Barco went on trial in Ventura County for first-degree murder. On April 5th, Barco was found guilty of murder in the first degree, while Pasquale was found not guilty, due principally to an alibi established for him by many friends who rallied to his defense and convinced the jury of his innocence. There was not a shadow of doubt in the minds of the officers who worked on the case that Pasquale, too, was guilty. But the jury felt otherwise, and so permitted a man who is unquestionably a murderer to have his liberty. Thank you, Chief Davis. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to meet our guest artist for the evening, Miss Joan Marsh, whom you have just heard in the part of Christine McSwiggan. Miss Marsh. Thank you. I'm glad to get out of character and to meet you, Mr. and Mrs. Audience. But I'm also anxious for you to meet the sponsor of this program, Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline. If I can bring you together, I know I'm doing a good turn for both of you. If you enjoy hearing calling all cars as much as I enjoy acting in it, we both owe the Rio Grande Oil Company a vote of thanks. 
And the best way to thank them is for you to drive into a real Grandy service station tonight or tomorrow and say, I've heard calling all cars and I want to try some of that cracked gasoline. And while you're at it, get a can of Sinclair oil, too. You'll be doing yourself a favor. I know. Because I use real Grandy cracked gasoline myself. And I get better performance out of my old bus now than I ever did before. Thank you, Joan Marsh. We've enjoyed your performance tonight, and we'll look forward to having you back on Calling All Cars soon again. And now, boys and girls, over 50,000 of you have joined the Junior Police Department. We want 100,000 members. We want you. You get absolutely free a genuine metal police badge like policemen wear. The rules and regulations of the Junior Police Department tell you how to save lives, how to prevent traffic accidents. It costs you absolutely nothing to join the Junior Police Department.